there's really three things that I want to cover with you today. Number one, I want to show you how OverOps is used to do very quick root cause analytics with production issues or really any issues at all. Number two, I want to show you how OverOps data can be used in CI CD pipelines, uh, really as you're building and testing your code. And number three, I want to show you how we can integrate our data with all the other tools that you have, ticketing systems, um, you know, production notification systems, all those things. As a Java developer or any developer in general, whenever you have an exception happen in an application, whether you're looking at the logs, whether you're looking at an APM, um, you know, when you drill down to what's actually happened with that exception, really the, the, the most you can get is the call stack. So this is a typical call stack from a parse exception that happens in a Java application. This call stack uh, in OverOps is different. So OverOps is going to tell you how and why this code broke. So this is all happening at runtime and it's all automatic which means you don't have to do any code instrumentation at all. There's no code changes you have to make for us to capture this data. So whenever an exception is thrown, this call stack in OverOps manifests itself this way. So you still see the exception here. For, for each frame, frame over frame, we actually show you the source code that was running it, and we show you all of the variable state at the time that this code broke. So for instance, that unparsable date, 08-30-2021. As I mouse over this, you can see that variable state and you can actually see the code right above it that it's looking for. So in this case, that unparsable date was simply because it's looking for a date with dashes, uh, with slashes and the date came through with dashes. So that's what actually made this break was that data was supposed to be running through the code this way. And as you can see over here on the right, we have all of the variable state at the time that this broke. So in this case, you can see where the exception was thrown. And as I had transverse down this call stack, each frame, you can actually see down here where this was actually caught as well. Here's another great thing is um, this source code we can actually tie back to your source control and um, we can actually from this go ex directly to the commit where this code was committed in your source control. So uh, you can see this was actually committed. This was a, a pretty old commit, but that block of code, we can get directly to your source control, who committed it and when and what, when the last changes were to the actual source code that we're looking for. Context is everything with the data that we're capturing. So not only are we capturing this source code in variable state, but we also have the ability to show when was the first time we ever saw this exception. In this case, we saw it on August 20th. What version or release that code was in, how many times that exception is happening, the server and the application and the deployment that it's currently in, all of that context is also captured when we get this data. Up here on the top, you can actually see uh, this exception itself when it's actually been happening. In this case, we were running this application a couple days ago and we ran this test app a little while yesterday. So you can see a couple days ago when it was happening and a couple days and yesterday when it was happening. And we can, we can actually go back and look at the data from a couple days ago if we want to. It's the same exception, uh, but now we're, we're seeing the snapshot that we took a couple days ago. In addition to this variable state and source code, we're also capturing information like environmental variables. So as you know, it's not always the code and the data that's breaking things. It could be things like environmental issues. You promoted code to a server that doesn't have the right you know, Java release or, you know, the right disk mounts. So we're actually capturing uh, all the information from the operating system and environment. At the same time, we're capturing the source code and variable state. All that's available here uh, in our environmental tab as well.
as we're looking at the data in a broader sense, let me go back here and I'll kind of show you, this would be all of the exceptions happening in, in these environments. So for instance, I'm gonna look at just my app here. We can see the exceptions happening, the number of times and the rates they're happening. We can also tell you what servers they are happening on. And that exception could be also happening in multiple applications. So there are ways uh, for us to uh, show you all the exceptions that are happening and where they're happening. So in that case, there could be issues with certain servers or with certain releases. So um, there are ways for us to show you that uh, in the UI. You could track down very easily a server that's having a problem because it's ex an exception that's only happening on one server. You know, you could be running uh, an app that's running, you know, five nodes and only one server is throwing the exception. That's a very good use case for saying, hey, there's a problem with that server. And we can show you all that in our, in our UI. All of these filters here, there's, there's a bunch that are pre-made. So anytime you release new code, we create uh, a filter for anything that's new in that release. We create those over here on the left. We also have things that are like new today. Here's exceptions that are we've only seen in the last 24 hours that we've never seen before. That's something that's new today or new this week. You know, we also have filters set up specifically for the apps that we're monitoring. So here's all the data from my shopping cart app. Here's all the data from my Makito app, which is a little bit older because we haven't ran it for a while. So, so yes, there's, there's filters built in, but you can also create your own. You're not limited to the filters that we have here. Uh, any of these like things can be um, filtered. Let's say for instance, I wanna just look at uh, any um, arithmetic exceptions. I could say, hey, I want, here's all my arithmetic exceptions. I can save that filter any way you want. You can save those filters and then you can also do notifications based on those. So, you know, if, if you can do email, Slack, Jira, we can send things to Microsoft Teams, um, ServiceNow, all of these things can be set up to send the data to these other tools. And, and my next step is gonna show you how the data is used in these other tools. The things that I showed you here, that root cause stream, that's really great to use, you know, debugging things in production. You never have to worry about how to recreate an exception. All the data is already there. So you never have to dig around and log files and try to figure out what the variable state was. But that same data is great to use when you're building code as well. So think of it in this sense is Jenkins or any pipeline tool is going to build, uh, compile, deploy that code and then start running unit tests and regression tests. When those tests are running, OverOps is gonna be monitoring that running code. And at the end of that process, we query OverOps and tell us, all right, for this release, for this code build, tell me how many new exceptions happened, you know, total exceptions, critical exceptions. All of this data is now available inside your Jenkins or CloudBees environment. And you can actually click from here in Jenkins and get back to that root cause screen that I was showing you before. So, as you're building code, you can very quickly get to what was happening at runtime and what the variable state was when it broke during those tests. Think of OverOps as a value add for any tools that you currently have. Uh, there aren't any tools that are automatically doing runtime analysis. You know, you have tools like SonarCube, do static analysis, and I'll show you that next as well. You have uh, you know, logs where you have to turn up verbosity of logs to try to capture this information. There aren't any tools out there that are automatically capturing this runtime data that OverOps has. You know, uh, there's always a, a gap at the end of the day when you get down to an APM tool that can capture a stack trace, but they don't have any of the variable state, right? You always have to do all this extra work to figure out what really broke it and OverOps is getting all of that data for you automatically. So you don't have to question how things broke anymore.
and all this stuff's done for you. It's in, it's captured and, and displayed to you within seconds. I mean, it's, it's very, very fast to be able to see what happened at runtime. Sonar is great for doing static analysis of the code as it's, as it's sitting in your repository before it's actually run. But you could also use Sonar Cube to you know, run pipelines and things as well. So our integration with Sonar Cube is we let Sonar Cube do all of their goodness, which is doing static analysis. At the end of we actually doing testing of that same code, we're going to run um, you know, the overops integration that tells us in that, in that code after it ran, here are new exceptions. So within Sonar Cube, anytime you see a bug there, you can now click on this bug and you can go see what it did at runtime as well. So you've got Sonar Cube that's static analysis, you've got overops that's doing the dynamic analysis at runtime. And all that is on one screen for you. So you never have to really do anything different in, in, in Sonar Cube or in Jenkins. All these links are there. So you can get to the runtime information very quickly. This, this same type of data is also available in your logs. So if you guys are using Kibana or Splunk, you know, and consuming logs from your applications, I'll show you here. This is kind of what we look like in Kibana. You know, Kibana is going to, you know, gather the logs from that running application. And inside any of those logs, we insert this tiny link. So um, this tiny link that's going to be in there for you automatically in every log, you can click on this from your log aggregation tool. And then again, it gets you back to that, to that root cause screen. All of that variable state that you don't have in the logs, you have that tiny link that gets you to all of the context that you need to figure out how the thing broke. The, the last thing I wanna show you is, you know, consider the fact that when you're in pre-production or even production, you might want to enter, you know, JIRA tickets for this. So let's say for instance, this null pointer you wanted to enter a JIRA ticket for. From right here in this screen, we can click this little send to JIRA button and that will create a JIRA ticket for us to put in and triage. And when we create those JIRA tickets, it's going to tell us the application it's in, the deployment that that exception was in, the server it happened on. But then as, as your developers are working through these JIRA tickets, they also, again, have this link. Let's go view the event. Let's see what happened when this code broke. So from JIRA, you click on that, and it gets you back to this root cause screen with all of that good context that you need to figure out why it broke at the time that that JIRA ticket was created. So lots of different integrations with CI CD, log management tools. These same tiny links go into the APM tools, um, all in, in your ticketing systems. That's the beauty of overops is, you know, you have all those tools, but not one of those can get you all of the context needed to solve the problem. Uh, and you're spending hours and hours, I would, I would guess in some cases, hours figuring out what happened when it broke. And Overoffs is getting you all the information uh, for that at, at break time. Think of Overoffs as, again, we're only monitoring things when the applications are running. Once it's been deployed and once it starts running and, and, and that code is being exercised, that's when Overoffs is being used. So... If your Jenkins process is building code, running system tests, and then kicks off an Ansible process that builds it and deploys it, that's where we would use overops in Jenkins saying, all right, um, you know, we ha we've had 10 new exceptions that we've never seen before. We don't want to deploy this code. So in, in that sense, you can set up the overops quality gate to say, hey, if there's 10 new exceptions, don't let Ansible deploy this. So these quality gates can actually stop that build process to not allow that code to be promoted if it doesn't satisfy the criteria that you want. You know, we actually have clients that will not allow their code into mm -hmm. production until it's been system tested and unit tested and overops is captured 
the runtime data, and only then will they allow Ansible and their deployment tools to, to build those images and push them out to those environments. Overops would be great for you to have a much better understanding of the quality of your code, especially after you've tested it and, and, you, and you've, you've run it before you ship that code. So I definitely see some advantages there. If you are using your ticketing systems to help fix that code, we have great integrations there. Wonderful, thank you again for your time.